Starby, I'm digging your collection of linen summer dresses here. I do. Oh, no. oh, no. oh, no. oh, no. oh, 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 Is my is this when you can't read and you can get stuck? I mean, I know we're so far. Hey, Derek, can Derek. you hear us? Yeah, yeah, you guys. Thanks. I can hear you. I I apologize. Um, this um, this iMac is is ancient. It's really nice, but it doesn't. I don't have the video uh, capacity on Zoom, so I apologize for that. So you get to look, stare at the Oregon coast and think about cooler temperatures, but um, yeah. But I can hear you. Great, we can hear you too. Thank you. So I have a text from Dave Pacifa that he's running a little bit late. He'll be here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order at 6:04. So you're uh, calling the meeting to order. Uh huh. Uh, you want, and you'll call, you can call the planning part to order as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll take a roll call for council, please. Uh, Mayor Ayersblood. Here. Councillor uh, Pare Miller. Here. Councillor Byers. Here. Councillor Pestizo. Be here shortly. Uh, Councillor Greeter. Greider. Greider. Not here. Uh, Councillor. Namaref? Here. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Councillor Kule? Not here. Uh, Planning Commission? Uh, Chair Riley? Not here. Part, our part of the order. Um, I'd like to call the City of Talent Planning Commission to order at 605. Roll call, please. Chair Riley? Not here. Uh, Vice Chair Shapiro? Here. Uh, Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Hazel. Here. Commissioner D'Amato. Here. Commissioner Volkart. Here. And Commissioner Clark is absent. We have a quorum. Lisa, I'm happy to yield the agenda to you. So if you want to carry us through. Sure. I did have a question about the agenda. So are we going to, because this agenda doesn't follow the normal guidelines. Of our yeah, we're treating it as okay. So I just wanted to talk about the minutes from our January and February me meeting has still have not been approved. Will we do that after the joint session, or will we? That will be next next planning meeting. That'll be exclusively. The next yeah. Okay. So Jason. Commissioner Clark is present. So, again, joint meeting. So, Nikki, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Mayor, Councilors, Commissioners. I am Nikki Hart Brinkley. I am with Green Top Planning Development and Research. I am a geographic information systems analyst, and I specialize in questions about land use, typically within the Oregon uh, regulatory context. 
I have been hired by the City of Talent to conduct a residential buildable lands inventory under a grant that has been provided by the Department of Land uh, Conservation and Development. As I talk about the buildable land inventory, I will start saying BLI, um, so I'll use those interchangeably. Um, the grant is in two parts, and tonight's meeting concludes the first part, which is the creation and presentation of a draft buildable land inventory. After tonight's meeting, we'll move through a period of uh, additional and final commentary on the draft uh, inventory. So I'll continue to be accepting feedback through August 1st. Um, and I will be going through uh, this website that you see in front of you that I have uh, produced to walk us through this uh, kind of complex um, piece of Oregon administrative rules. Um, BLIs are, are some of my favorite things to do because um, I think they're really valuable. I think they're really useful. So I'm excited to be a part of this. Thank you. Uh, as we move into phase two, phase two is going to be um, the final uh, buildable lands inventory. And there will be one additional joint meeting upon completion of that final uh, inventory. So I'll be back here again to present uh, you with um, the findings. Uh, what I'll be doing from now until we meet again is I'll be collecting all of the feedback that I've received through this process. I have had, uh, this is the third uh, meeting. We met with stakeholders. Uh, we had a, a public open house and I, I see some uh, familiar folks from that. Um, and now we're meeting again. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. And now we're meeting again to um, make sure that everyone in the city knows that there is a way to learn about this and to provide feedback. Um, I also welcome you to get in touch with me um, individually or in non-quorum numbers. Um, I'm happy to go over anything that we go over tonight in more detail. If you do have questions, the website is really intended to um, make this entire process uh, less opaque, um, more transparent, easier to understand. I really want you to feel empowered by this knowledge and not kind of, you know, here I've put all of your land in a black box and shook it up and, and here's what came out. I really like your participation in this. Um, so I'll be going through the website tab by tab and I'd like to just introduce those right now so that you know what's coming up. Um, after I've gone through the information on each tab, I'll pause for questions. If there's a question that comes up that is maybe better saved for later on in the presentation, I'll ask you to hold that. You might have to remind me because um, I get to talk in and get to, to roll in. So if I don't circle back to your question that I've asked you to hold, please do remind me. Uh, so initially, we're going to talk about what a buildable lands inventory is and why it's important to do one now. Um, we'll talk about the current conditions here in talent, uh, things like your comprehensive plan designations and your zoning and how that plays into deciding where your residential land is that I'm even analyzing. We'll talk about environmental and development constraints. So this process looks at land and it takes a whole bunch of land off the top that it considers unbuildable. And that's because we have a lot of different environmental constraints here in talent, um, mostly to do with waterways. There's a little bit of slope as well. Um, so we'll talk about how that impacts the buildability of land um, and also the development constraints beyond you know, just environmental conditions. So things like buffers around riparian areas, uh, things like that that are very specific to talent. We'll also talk about um, this kind of second part of the buildable lands inventory. One of the things that I really like about the guidance um, that this OAR offers is that we have this kind of prescriptive process. So you can go into a very large city and you can conduct a buildable lands inventory and it won't take you 20 years to do, it won't take you $2 million to complete. It makes it a very manageable process.
process. Um, but especially in a smaller town like Talent, we really have the opportunity to dig a little deeper and do a parcel by parcel analysis of what is buildable and what is not, uh, of course, within the, the framework of the rules. But we can dig a little deeper and that has been uh, one of the things that I want to convey to residents, to business owners and to leadership here is that I won't capture every single tax slot correctly. If there's something about your property um, that you know is a development constraint, let's say you've got you know, a covenant on your property for you know, a 50 foot buffer across the backyard um, because RVSS has uh, their wastewater going through there. That's not something I'm gonna immediately know from the data that's available to me. I'd have to dig into your titles and really you're the experts on your land. And so when I'm asking for feedback, um, I, I want to answer all of your questions about this process, but I'm really looking for your expertise on the properties that you own, the properties that you visit, um, the properties that you're most familiar with, because you are the experts on your land. Um, then we'll get into the initial uh, draft buildable lands inventory. Um, We've shaken the black box and, and we've come out with a number and here it is. Um, and so I'll be looking at that. And I'll also introduce you to the buildable lands uh, status interactive map. And this is where you can take a deep dive. You can click on every property. It shows you exactly what I have found there at that property. You'll know if it intersects with one of the environmental constraints that we're looking at. You'll know um, how much buildable land is there. Uh, and you'll be able to understand why I've come to the conclusion that I've come to um, and, and make comments on it. You'll notice that on every page, there is a link to the uh, buildable land survey. And if you click on that link, that's going to allow you to fill out a survey. This comes directly to me. Um, you can ask a general question or you can submit feedback on a particular tax lot. So you can type in the address, type in your feedback. Um, let me know if you want to be contacted. Uh, and again, this is on every page. So you'll be able to access that easily. Um, this entire website is on the uh, community development website for the city of talent. So to navigate to this, you can go to the city's website. You can also Google talent buildable lands inventory, and you should be able to find it in your search engine. And with that, I'm going to just stop and ask question or ask your questions about the process before I dive in. I'm going to move the other end of the room so I can see the video. Yeah, that would be easier. <laughs> Um, I see that there's a uh, comment in in chat. Is there is there anything that I need to address before I move on? So you don't. Get a <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, I will be reading some of this verbatim. Uh, I think that I did a fairly good job summarizing it, but again, um, I'll be inviting questions to take a deeper dive and to clarify any points. So what is a buildable land inventory? It aims to establish current conditions within a city and measure how much buildable land exists within a city. This process provides a snapshot of how much development a city currently has and what development can take place given existing zoning, comprehensive plan designations, environmental constraints, and other development considerations. Now, again, this grant is only for residential lands. We did not look at employment lands. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because now, you know, we, we do have rules that allow for residential uses in commercial lands. And I'll talk a little bit about how this is a portion of the building block that can lead to all of this uh, other studies um, uh, that the city might want to conduct. So Talent's need for an updated buildable lands inventory. Talent last conducted a BLI in preparation for the housing needs analysis adopted in 2017, but following the Almeida fire, the buildable conditions in the city have changed. This project will produce a buildable lands inventory consistent with OAR 66038, providing an inventory of residential lands post Almeida fire within Talent. 
This work is critical to understanding what lands remain available for housing recovery, provide guidance for the railroad district feasibility study, and form the basis for a future, future housing capacity analysis. The build of a land inventory follows a process defined by Oregon Administrative Rule 660-38. It's called the Simplified Urban Growth Boundary Method. This process allows us to examine talent's lands in ways that provide an overall picture about development in talent, as well as a tax lot by tax lot examination of what development looks like in the midst of disaster recovery. Project focuses on residential lands only and requires the identification of residential use tax lots, the density of housing on those lands, and the status of development on each property. Uh, so here I've got uh, a few resources listed for, for further reading. If you want to find your adopted housing analysis, you'll find it there, along with the administrative rule for the simplified urban growth boundary method that has some differences with the other uh, urban growth boundaries um, that is the, the full version of that. We don't need to, to get into the nuts and bolts of the differences between uh, a regular UGB amendment and a simplified UGB amendment here. It's not applicable. All of the work that is done for doing a residential land inventory is the same. And the reason that the BLI is part of an urban growth boundary amendment is, like I stated before, it's one of the core building blocks. So we have these processes that we go through, these studies that we do, residential lands, commercial lands, then we go into a uh, housing capacity analysis. And at that point, you as a city can determine uh, what you want to do with the lands that you have. If there's additional infill, if there's upzoning that can take place to accommodate additional residential lands, or if perhaps an urban growth boundary amendment is needed, you will have all of the building blocks that you need to move through the, the regulatory process, starting with this piece here. So I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions before I move on to current conditions. So far, so good. Okay. So the, uh, the guide provides uh, that I can identify for residential land use by either comprehensive plan designation or zoning. Typically we use comprehensive plan designation first because first of all, we're looking at the entire urban growth boundary. And of course there's no zoning outside of your city limits. So you wanna have a consistent way of looking at all of your lands. But Tinlet has a couple of different things that make that challenging. Um, and so I have used uh, zoning here and I explain why. Uh, they're both used to, to define residential land use in Talent for, for the purpose of, of the BLI. The city of Talent defines low, medium, and high density in zoning, but only defines low and high density in its comprehensive plan designations, along with a manufactured home classification which does not have a density classification. So again, it's really important for me to understand how the density is assigned within the city. And that is a lot clearer in your zoning than it is in, in your comprehensive plan designation. So the, for the purpose of assigning residential use and density, city zoning is used as the primary resource for defining residential use and density. Outside of the urban growth boundary, the comprehensive plan is used to define residential use. And some residential zone tax lots have public use or parks comprehensive plan designations. And these are excluded as buildable residential land. So I, I want to point this out because there's a couple of things here. Um, first, we have um, this area, which of course is the Culver Road, uh, Phoenix Talent School District property. I believe the annexation is complete sure. there. So when I do the update, I will of course uh, be expanding this boundary to include that. So I just wanted to note that there is a bit of a difference that has taken place since the time I made this map and now, uh, but I will be correcting that in future maps. 
So I wanted to point that out as well as you'll see this is um, this is all uh, Talent Phoenix School District here. In your zoning, it is zoned residential medium density. And I'm showing it here as residential medium density, but you'll see later on that I've taken that out of further consideration because even though the zoning says residential, because it's a public use, we're able to take that off the top and say, this is not available currently for residential use and it's not considered further. So you'll see that area uh, is removed. And I just wanted to explain that little bit of difference too. Um, so each buildable land uh, will have a density status and it's it has to be categorized as low, medium or high density residential. These categories are defined by OAR 660-3860. Generally for talents population size, low density is classified again by the state by the OAR as having a density of eight or fewer dwelling units per acre. For medium density, there are eight to 16 dwelling units per acre. And N density higher than 16 dwelling units is considered high density. However, not all residential tax lots fall under these three categories. As mentioned earlier, some tax lots that are zoned residential or have a residential comprehensive plan designation are exempt from further consideration in this process. Public facilities, parks, private road roadways, and open space are exempt from consideration. Additionally, any lands that are undevelopable for reasons other than defined environmental or development constraints are also removed. And this is really little stuff, kind of odd stuff, little bits of places that maybe should be in right of way, but aren't necessarily. That just kind of uh, cleans up some of these unclassified lands. Uh, so that can include roadways or other unusual conditions uh, not covered in other sections. So this is how the uh, buildable uh, land density status looks. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, medium density residential. We've got your high density residential here in orange and uh, low density residential, mostly uh, here in the south uh, and southwest corners of Helen. I'm ready to move on to environmental and development constraints, but I'll take questions before I move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just kind of wondering about what you said about the comprehensive plan not having the same zoning as our, our zoning documents. And I, is that an inconsistency or? Um... Um, I wouldn't call it an inconsistency. Both have their strengths. Um, it is a, a bit unusual that there's no medium density. It may have been decided at one time that the um, the residential manufactured home uh, comprehensive plan designation was in that medium density residential, um, but I, I'm not sure why those two things are different. One of the things that, that we can look at is where differences exist between your zoning and comprehensive plan. And as you move through some of this process, you might want to revisit some of those and um, just do a little bit of, of uh, zoning uh, or uh, comprehensive plan cleanup, especially if you're moving towards adopting changes to your comprehensive plan, uh, packaging it all together and moving it through uh, all at one time um, is you know, gonna gonna be a better use of, of everyone's time and resources to, to package everything together when you know the goals that you're making. Anyone else? Is there a question in chat? Yeah, I don't know if you want me to check these. I have my hand up. Um I'm I apologize. This is uh Commissioner Volkart. I uh <laughs> I dropped and had to reset internet and uh so I missed that. And I was just following up on Councillor Panamara's comment because I did I missed that altogether. Um, what was the medium density um, di discrepancy between the comp plan and the map? Sure. So there there are some differences between. I'll I'll go back up here to um, your comprehensive plan designations and your zoning. 
And these will be a little bit difficult to visually compare, I'm sure. But there are some differences between your zoning and your comprehensive plan designations that you might want to take a look at uh, overall for some long-term goals in aligning the zoning and comprehensive plan um, a little bit, uh, a little bit more streamlined. Um, the thing that that I struggled with with the comprehensive plan designations is that you have a residential manufactured home comprehensive plan designation um, that does not have a, a functional density. So uh, manufactured home uh, comprehensive plans do not uh, state what the density of those lands should be. And because I need to understand talent's assignment of low, medium, and, and high density land use for the purpose of this project, it was important for me to fall back on, on using zoning primarily uh, to establish residential lands and to establish the density um, at each of those different uh, density classifications, low, medium, and high. Does that answer that question more fully? Yeah, thank you. I, I apologize for having you repeat it. Um, oh, not at all. Not at all. I'm glad you asked. And, and then, but and my, let me just follow up with that. But there is, but the um, the constraints within the manufactured housing, or maybe there, maybe you're saying there are no constraints as far as so there are there is no density uh, density isn't addressed in RMH. Uh, in in your comprehensive plan designation. Uh, the density is not specified for residential uh, manufactured uh, home comprehensive plan designations, correct? So it falls back to state standards for building? Well, we need to understand how talent sees that um, sees okay. density. Okay. And, and that is outlined nicely in talent's uh, zoning code. And talent zoning code aligns uh, very well with the uh, the threshold set by the state for for those low, medium, and high density uh, uh, figures. So, uh, it, thank you. Yeah, thank no you. problem. Sure. So, so, sorry for the repeat. All right. No, not at all. Yeah. So, just addressing that on the planning commission, when we were um, when we were rezoning or changing the the comp plan. Um, we specifically uh, did look at mobile home parks and because it was one of the most affordable housing forms at that time, and this is long before the Alameda fire, mm -hmm. we decided as, as a group that we did not want to impose the limitations on them so that they wouldn't have to change the way so that they wouldn't have to either eliminate or couldn't put in a mobile home because it was affordable. So if we put those densities in there, they would have to build if, if rather than bringing in mobile homes. So that's how that was established at that time. Thank you for, for that background. There's always a reason. I just don't, don't know it and it, it might not always uh, seem immediately apparent, but that's really good background to have and can help inform what happens next. So. I just want to say for clarification, though, that it wasn't an update to the comp plan. It was just an update to the to the zoning. The zoning. Yeah, to the zoning. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we move forward? Okay. Moving on to environmental and development constraints. Now, as a GIS person, this is where it gets really interesting and, and, and really fun to work with the different types of constraints in uh, talent. There are physical constraints to lands um, that include environmental constraints and lands under local development restrictions. So within talent, these restrictions include the regulatory floodway, which of course is really Bear Creek and, and where it you know meanders and, and rises um, so so properly the, the water itself. There's a 35 foot buffer around the regulatory floodway, and that is a talent development standard. The 1% annual chance flood hazard, again, this is a, a FEMA 
uh, designated area that used to be known as the 100 year floodway. Uh, the local wetlands inventory talent has an adopted local wetlands inventory that is on file with the Department of State Lands. Um, you also have a 50 foot wetland setback and that again is a local condition in addition to the local wetlands inventory. You have a 50 foot riparian setback uh, measured from the top of banks, again, a challenge development code, and slopes of 25% or greater in one acre of contiguous area. The map to the right shows these combined areas, and these combined areas are, uh, these combined impacted lands are deducted from buildable areas for each residential tax slot. And the maps that I'm about to show will illustrate each one of those development constraints. So again, we're looking at all of them right now. Councilor Pacizo, I know you weren't here for this, but I'm waiting until the end of each tab to take questions about the tab that we're on. So if you can hold your question for just a moment. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the uh, first level here is again those city of talent flood hazards with the regulatory floodway the annual chance uh, flood hazard and that 35 foot buffer the city of talent local wetlands inventory with the 50 foot buffer the city of talent riparian buffer which is a 50 foot riparian buffer measured from the top of the bank and the contiguous one acre slope of 25% or more. So this is a, a, an interesting one because uh, the way that we do this, we look at slopes and how quickly they rise. And so we measure that by percent and it's a very fine grained analysis. So you end up with all of the slope along roadways. It becomes kind of noisy and the way that uh, DLCD decided to deal with some of this noise that isn't really meaningful for our analysis is to say that we need to measure only those slopes that connect with each other contiguously for at least one acre. So everything that you're seeing that covers and is connected to at least one acre of land. You still see a bit of the noise in there along the railroad um, and along certain waterways, but generally the slope that we're dealing with is something that everyone's very well aware of uh, here at the south and southwest uh, corner of, of talent. And so with that, Councilor Pacito. Mm -hmm. Did you want to so that's the, that's the one, it used to be known as the one hundred. Oh, it's not on. <laughs> so what I'm wondering is, is that really exclusive to building or do you have to build above base by elevation? So I think one of the things that you might be thinking about is the 0.2 special floodway, and that is the 500 year that's, um, it shows in orange on FEMA maps. This does not show that. This is only the floodway and the 1% annual chance, chance flood hazard. Um, according to the regulatory guidance, anything in the 1% annual chance flood hazard can be removed 100%. It's not, and this brings up a really good point of what the buildable land inventory does not do. This does not become a talent regulatory guide. Uh, this does not say you can't build here. So when we're looking at that 1% annual chance flood hazard, this is some of the stuff that you were dealing with in rebuilding in the flood plain, that larger uh, area of flood plain but it's not necessarily a complete development restriction. However, the guidance from this OAR does state that we can remove this land entirely from development consideration because of its presence within the 1% annual chance. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and that actually reminds me that I don't know that the 1% 
was included in previous editions of the environmental constraints. Um, I don't think that it was. Um, that was something that I kind of reached out to them. Thanks, Nikki, for that. Um, so I, I know that there is some uh, development in the flood plain currently. And so if we were to move, remove any flood plain for consideration, and I can understand why that would be an advantage, um, especially if, we, if we're interested in, in annexing, um, would that have any detrimental effect for those Two questions. Would it have any detrimental effects for those who are already developed? And then by removing it, does that also say that it cannot be developed? It, or is it just for the purpose of counting the inventory? Yeah, these are excellent questions. Um, so it, it only says that from this analysis, we don't have to move, we don't have to include these that are buildable, but it has no bearing whatsoever on what people can do on that link. That is um, that is entirely under the guidance of, of Palin's uh, regulatory code. Right. So that's a really important point to make, and I'm glad that you brought that up because one of the things this does not do is supersede anything involving talent building or land use code. If I've said that something's fully developed, that does not mean that you can't come in and visit Nick and say, hey, I'm interested in putting a second unit on my property. What this says about your property is that it is as built out as the state expects it to be. But what you can do with your land is a, a lot more uh, a lot more complicated and, and will uh, involve talent code. So this definitely does not make a rule about what you can and cannot do with your land. These would never get done if that were the case. I would make sweeping decisions about uh, how your city looks, and, and that's definitely not me. So I'm really glad to say that. Thanks. Yeah. So um, okay, I've gone through local wetlands, hit the slopes. Um, we, we put all of these together so that I'm only deducting them from the land <clears> one time. So um, rather than go through and remove all of the riparian area and then remove all of the floodway area, in order to make sure I'm only deducting the land once, I put it all together in, in one, excuse me, scary red layer <laughs> and, and then I deduct it from the land. And this is all calculated out later and you'll see where this comes into play. So everything in red gets removed 100%. But what I wanted to talk about is, for example, you see this land right here, it's all within some kind of environmental or and or development constraint. So nothing is buildable here. This is going to show up uh, as developed. Actually, this is commercial, so this was a bad example. But it's big enough to see on your screen. So. Um, but in other places, this red area is only going to encroach a little bit on land. So what do we do with that? Well, I only take the portion of the land that is impacted. So if you have a one acre piece of property and there is 0.2 acres of environmental constraints, I'm only going to look at that 0 0.80 acres that is left over because I know that that 0 0.20 is constrained already. Okay, and that covers uh, environmental and development constraints. Are there any additional questions before I move on to the draft? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we're not. Uh, we're not taking speaker requests. We don't have any speaker request forms at this meeting. Was that from you, Nadia? Yeah. Uh, so we'll just not taking questions on chat or taking questions on meeting. Yeah, I will take a moment though to point out that um, the website that we're going uh, that we're looking at right now is available from the uh, talent community development page. It's also searchable by uh, talent buildable land inventory, and on each of these tabs, there is a link to a buildable land survey, and you can click on that and provide feedback about specific um, sites that you see. You can ask questions. You can read all about this um, from the website. 
Okay. It's also helpful to know that once we get past study section and, and this goes into the uh, phases of adoption, it goes to a public hearing and okay. uh, and and literally we'll be hearing from the public at that time. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh moving to the draft buildable lands inventory. So in the previous steps, um we've established residential land use. We've measured the impacts of environmental and local development constraints. And then the next step measures existing development by the presence or absence of homes. So for each home present on a tax lot, one quarter of an acre is deducted from the developable acreage. If more than one quarter acre remains after housing and constrained lands are removed, the tax lot is considered partially vacant. If less than a quarter acre remains after housing and constrained lands are removed, the tax lot is considered developed. If a tax lot has no housing present and has more than a half an acre, I'm sorry, a quarter acre available for development after constraints are removed, it is considered vacant. So let me use an example. So let's take that acre of land that we have. And let's say that there is a half an acre that is environmentally constrained. Now we're only working with a half an acre of potentially buildable land. Then we, we discover our house is on it. So I take another quarter acre off, but we still have a quarter acre available. That initial one acre parcel of land, even though it's environmentally constrained and already has a house on it, is considered partially vacant. And we count that one quarter acre as available for development. Um, Chair Riley uh, brought up an excellent question in one of the earlier sessions. She said, why a quarter of an acre? Th that house would be giant, right? No, I, I don't, maybe there's homes in East Lansing or in the East Metric. <laughs> Parking back to my <laughs> It needs to measure that is that big, um, but we don't have anything that's you know forty thousand square feet probably here in Talent. Um, the reason for that is that the state considers that what's called a safe harbor, and a quarter of an acre is a typical small lot that's going to allow you to have a driveway, a garage, a single family home, um, and maybe you know an outbuilding. It's just sort of one of those um, easy to measure minimum land areas um, that we consider a safe harbor, a safe number um, for development. Now, let's say that quarter of an acre that's actually empty is in your backyard and your driveway and your house take up all of the space and there's no way you can get a driveway to go back to that house. There's no way you could get even, you know, construction materials back there. That's another place that you as homeowners, as landowners, as business owners can come in and say, I, I've tried to, to figure out a way to build this, but I would have to demolish a third of my house just to get um, construction materials back there. That's something that I tried to account for by looking at recent imagery. Um, but if I haven't captured it correctly, that's another area where residents can be immensely helpful to come in and say, hey, I asked the city if I could build an ADU back there. We just can't make it work. I've got fence setbacks with my neighbors. I got, you know, all kinds of different things going on. Can't be done. Um, so I won't always capture those 100% correctly. Um, and that's really helpful feedback to have. Um, let's see. So there are additional considerations that may not be fully captured within the standard BLA analysis. Um, and, and talent remains in recovery from the Alameda fire of 2020. And the conditions of recovery complicate the build the land status of some residential stat tax lots because you might not have a house there right now, but maybe there's a building permit in review. Maybe someone has purchased the land and is partitioning it. There's some sort of uh, land use permit that is in review. So I have identified each tax lot that has not been rebuilt. I've assessed whether or not it has any kind of land use or building permit action on it. 
And I have marked that as design. If it is at any point in recovery, if anyone has come in and start going through the permitting process to build on that property, I am considering it developed. That's something that the state code doesn't address, but it's one of those um, tricky situations where we have to come in and we have to do a little bit more careful analysis. Now I finished the buildable lands inventory um, in, uh, it was late winter. So there's definitely going to be some things that you might identify right away. Oh, hey, I know that's rebuilt. That's my property um, or it's in the process of rebuilding. It might not be something I, I uh, was able to capture because I, I haven't looked at that permit data uh, in a couple of months. When I move through the next phase and I'm finalizing everything, I'll take a fresh look at all your permits and I'll make sure that all of that is captured. Okay, um, yes. Is it the right time to ask questions? Yes, go ahead. I was just going to look at some of this, but there's a better map of this that's interactive. So, but go ahead, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused about parcels and tax lots. Um, the example you gave was really good for describing what would happen with a large yeah. uh, parcel. I'm thinking of a neighborhood with, where they're a lot smaller than a quarter of an acre, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, I, so one question is, how do you how do you how do you figure that out? Yes, that's a great question. So, anytime I had a, a, a small tax lot, you know, and, and we've got I think some of the smaller ones are like 0.12 or 0.15. When I saw that something was really close. When I saw that it was, you know, something that was impacted by the fire and wasn't necessarily in uh, recovered status, didn't have any permit, I marked that as vacant because even though the state standard says quarter of an acre above buildable, quarter of an acre below not buildable, we want to match both the letter and the spirit of the regulatory guidance, and it would not be. Clear, it wouldn't be accurate to take all of those smaller parcels out. So I have included those as vacant or developed or part, well, there's no perfectly vacant, it's um, better that small. But so you'll see a scattering of those smaller lots marked as vacant. And again, those might be um, in some sort of recovery status that I just haven't captured yet. But yeah, the point. Yep. So that's thanks. And that's yeah. my question. There's like a ton of those. Um, uh, my second question is you talked about, you know, homeowners coming in and saying, oh, actually, this is buildable or there isn't buildable. Um, I'm not sure what incentive I would have as a as a homeowner or a landowner to come and uh, set you straight yeah. on what's going on with my lot since it's not regulatory or anything. I'm just wondering uh, whether folks will do that. What, what's the incentive and um, and what happens if they don't? Um, nothing happens if they do, except for that my data gets better and we have a more accurate picture of the city and what's on it and what's buildable and what's not. Um, there's probably not a great deal of incentive beyond, you know, public participation and community effort. Um, and there's, there's absolutely no kind of um, consequences for anyone who doesn't correct it. Uh, so. That's a really interesting question. I haven't thought of it that way before. <laughs> yeah, I like that question. Okay, um, so this this uh, map is going to show you this uh, this draft buildable land status, and we'll get into the interactive portion, which I find easier to use and interact with and, and tell what's going on. But mostly, you can get a pretty good picture here of what is happening. Anything in red, anything in blue, anything shaded out um, in gray, those are all developed or unbuildable for various reasons described through this process. Um, whatever is green is vacant. I do expect, again, some of those to fill in. Um, when I did this, I, I knew there was green? kind of coming in the pipeline for yeah. development. But um, so, so some of those will go away as well. Um, and the, the orange areas here, this is not gonna be a big shock to anyone. You live here, you know what development is happening and where and what's not being developed. 
And so what you're going to see is that most of the partially vacant land um, is in the railroad district's area. Much of it is outside of the city limits in the UGB. There is some that's inside of the UGB, um, but the vast majority of acre to acre, what is available, regardless if it's vacant or partially vacant, is in the railroad district. Um, so just addressing this uh, feedback mechanism here, um, should you or additional residents decide to participate, uh, city staff, stakeholders, residents, business owners, selected officials are invited to review and provide feedback. Uh, together we improve the accuracy, um, but other, other than that, there might not be any real apparent incentive um, to participate but I am very fond of having things correct and you can help me uh, make those, uh, those things uh, more accurate. And so I do appreciate your feedback um, and uh, your review of the work. Um, so there is this uh, draft buildable lands inventory, again, available on each page and um, specifically from this page, you can navigate to it. Um, I know I've covered a lot, especially, you know, taking out all of the different parts and pieces of this. Are there any additional questions before I move into the interactive map portion? Yes. I'm just wondering, did you take into consideration accessibility? Like if, uh, is I'm familiar with someone who was thinking of developing close to an acre of his property? And he has a right of way that's wide enough, but the apron requirement he thinks he can't meet. So that's a really that's a really good question because um, it kind of trespasses into this area of uh, infrastructure and practicability. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead and address that there for certain constraints. Like I I kind of gave an example of we've got a fence setback, this this that and the other thing. Um, if you're not able to get anything built on that property, if you've been through the process and there's just no way to get something built there for whatever reason, um, whether it be a uh, fence setback or repairing issue or an apron or, uh, you know, you've got a piece of land that is completely landlocked by your neighbors, you have no easements um, for access. Those things can absolutely be taken out as developed, uh, uh, taken out as partially vacant or vacant and marked as developed. Sorry about that. Um, because there are local development constraints that prevent that from happening. So that is an, that is kind of an infrastructure constraint. Um, impractical. There's no way to safely uh, get a vehicle on and off that property. What this will not do is take a huge swath of land that is already in your UGB and make a decision that it is unbuildable due to infrastructure and practicability. So it would not be within my power or interest to use the BLI to make decisions about your railroad district. Um, there is a portion of UGB that does address situations like this, but it is not for buildable land inventories, and it's not for a UGB process that isn't looking at priority lands. A priority lands analysis happens when you do not have urban reserve areas. If you don't have urban reserve areas, one of the things that you can do is you can go through a priority land analysis. You look at all of the lands outside of your city limits and you decide based on a series of rules what is and is not appropriate for development. And that'll be things like um, looking for, uh, you know, forest lands and things like this, things that aren't necessarily a priority usually. Um, for the state to say, yeah, that's a great place for an urbanized area to stay to. Um, and one of the things that, that that we'll look at is infrastructure and practicability. And those are going to be really big things like you can't get water there. You can't get a road there. Um, 
really large development constraints. But again, that has nothing to do with the sales of the lands inventory. These are measured from within your existing UVB. Um, it does not, it, it's not appropriate for any kind of UGB uh, amendment that has um, to do with uh, a city that already has urban reserve areas. That really is only if you're expanding out and looking at other areas to expand your UGB because of other constraints. So this is one thing I am not going to be looking at. I have to give feedback about about the buildability of um, some of the partially vacant lands in your um, railroad district, but that's not something that I can take and say this is developed because of an issue um, with capacity of the railroad. That's not something that I need to be addressing. Okay. Uh, so here is the buildable lands uh, status interactive map. And so basically this takes everything that you just saw in that static map and it makes it interactive. And so we can get really close in on any property that is residential and has a buildable lands status attached to it. You can also click on it and you're gonna get a pop-up that's gonna bounce around, there we go. And it's going to have all of the information about that particular tab. Ownership, zoning, comprehensive plan designation, how large the acre is, does it intersect with any of those environmental constraints or development constraints that we've talked about? If so, you're going to have a number here of how many acres were deducted um, from those environmental constraints. You're going to have a residential density test low density. You're going to have um, how many acres are developed with housing. There's uh, point, you know, two five acres, a quarter of an acre uh, per unit. And uh, the draft BLI status is partially vacant, and we've got 0.4 acres that are available for development. So let me just quick over that map again. We've got 0.65 uh, acres of land total. A quarter of an acre is developed out because we've got one house on it. And so according to this analysis, we have 0.4 left over. Now, when I'm calculating this and saying how much land is available for development, I'm not counting this as that 0.65. I'm only counting the 0.40. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm taking out what's already built and I'm no longer considering that. So this is something that you can play around with and interact with and, and click on and ask all kinds of questions about, about different parts of the city, what it is and what it looks like. Um, there are some that I've made some comments on um, because I've, you know, I've taken a, another look at it and said, Ooh, I don't, this says partially vacant, but that fence is really close to the house and I don't think this is gonna work. Um, so I might have made a decision one way or another um, when things weren't quite clear, and I made sure to catalog my notes on that when, when I made those types of decisions. So what are the magic numbers that we're at right now? And again, I, I want to make sure that folks know that these figures are preliminary. They will change a bit um, from between now and the time that we meet again. Um, but probably not a ton. Um, tax cuts by land use classification. So this is overall, this is everything that's in talent, regardless of if it's built, not built, vacant, whatever. This is your whole land area. Um, you have uh, 971 uh, residential medium density tax lots that make up 44% of your land area. And then so on and so forth, 661. Uh, high density, 30%, followed by low density, point of lands, parks, public. The low, medium, and high density residential developable lands. Now, this is boils everything down into just looking at your residential lands. Is it low density, medium density, or high density? You have 100 acres 
better low density. Again, that's not a big surprise because all of that land in um, the railroad district uh, that is partially vacant, that's all low density residential. High density, you've got a 10, 11 acres. I expect this to change. There were a couple of high density uh, parcels that were just on the cusp of entering into the permitting system when last I saw this. So I expect this number to go down. And then medium density, um, 3.8 acres of medium density residential. How does this all break down? So um, most of the tax lots in talent are fully developed that are residential. You've got 40 that are uh, partially vacant and 82 that are vacant, but that number, that, full, that total number of acres is pretty small. You've got 13, 14 acres that are uh, vacant, even though they're spread across 82 tax lots. It's a lot of, a lot of small tax lots. So again, not a big surprise from the map. So we've seen earlier, you're partially vacant is that low density residential uh, in, in the uh, railroad district. And that concludes presentation. So I'm opening it up for questions, it's not only about this, but for other things I may have missed, questions about what's next. Um, I would like to touch briefly on um, that building block idea again. This is, you know, one piece. It's a really, really important piece of all of these other steps that you as a city can decide to do. Doing an employment land analysis. Now that we have the residential land analysis, is really easy because you know exactly what you're looking for. Whatever you didn't look at before, you're going to look at now. So getting this out of the way and doing this, the employment lands is, is a really simple process to do from here. You'd want to do that as part of a housing capacity analysis. Again, you would attack that question of, um, you know, what can we do with our commercial lands um, for residential capacity? That would be answered in, in your HCA. Uh, you'd want to take a look at your comprehensive plan, decide if you uh, want to make some changes there, um, just revisit zoning, make sure everything is nice and cleaned up. Uh, and then move through uh, the UGB process to decide if that's something that you want to do as a city or not. But that, yeah. So this doesn't include any like uh, joint uh, commercial residential availability. Right. Okay. No, this is this is very clearly delineated just residential. Okay. And it does get a bit messy where, you know, commercial and residential uses are a bit mixed in. So this type of analysis typically can miss little bits of that. I do try to capture it, but there's not a lot in right. talent. Um, so I didn't spend a terrible lot of time okay. making sure that all of that was considered because you might have, you know, a, a, I lived above my parents' mm -hmm. uh, shop in a little small town in, in Michigan for years, right. and it wouldn't capture that right. type of living arrangement. Okay. But that's a really small, piece right. of it that isn't going to change the, the metrics either way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So then what is the employment land that you're talking about? Right yeah, so the employment land is going to be anything that is uh, zoned commercial or uh, industrial. So all of your, um, let's see, the commercial uh, central business district, highway central business, um, highway commercial, commercial interchange um, neighborhood and the industrial zone. So uh, we would be taking a look at all of this land here um, to look at uh, all of the, the commercial zones and that the employment lands you do for, for a full uh, housing capacity analysis that includes an employment analysis as well. Um, and, and that's good to do all together so that you can answer these broader types of questions. How much land do we have? How much land do we need? Um, and where do we go if we don't have enough? I thought you were just addressing residential land. I am. I am in, in this residential um, land analysis. Yes, but the next step could be to look at employment lands and because, uh, or yeah, employment lands because now uh, residential uses are uh, allowed in commercial zones 
and that makes it a little more complicated to look at, you know, all of the different housing options in talent. Um, but that would be appropriate to do your employment land so that you know even what's available, what's not built out, and then with a housing capacity analysis to get deeper dive into that. I guess sorry if that was my thing. Yeah, a little bit help. Yeah. So I'm I'm guessing the answer to this is no, but I'm wondering if there's any um, economic dimension to this. And I was trying to think about a way you might be able to do it, like uh, maybe just like seeing how long um, a piece of land has been vacant, if there's a trend of just not having a lot of development um, in an area. So I, I'm thinking that, that this was not part of your analysis, but I was wondering, is it ever talked about or is there another study that looks at that sort of thing? Um, when you do a market analysis for the housing capacity analysis, it will take into consideration those types of questions, but for the billable land inventory, no, it doesn't take a look at that. But this, it's a great use of this type of data because of course we capture um, all kinds of information and can look at when the property was last sold and for how much like that if, if a property is in data. Yeah, and I, I follow up on the housing capacity analysis. So. Um, at the state level, you know, I've heard them talk about taking a more regional approach yeah. um, to the housing problem and stuff like that. So um, some of us were th went through the housing needs analysis um, process and the UGB and all of that. Um, we're familiar with that. Um, how, how, do you have any ideas how we expect a housing capacity analysis um, to be different? Uh, um, so they, they, the state has released uh, regional housing capacity analysis. Um, it is my understanding, and this is not a final word on this because uh, that's outside of, of what I'm doing here, but uh, for a UGB, I believe there has to be a local adopted housing capacity analysis. Um, and the last HNA, I think from 2017, did it find a deficiency in housing then, or was it kind of on the cusp? I well, I'm that. gonna I'm looking at the mirror nodding. Yeah, yeah. Was a deficiency. there was a deficiency <laughs> then. So the anticipated outcome of a new HCA is not much different um, than what it was in the past. The metrics will have changed a little bit. There are new dynamics because of the fire. Um, but the end result, the needle has not. So. I have a question for Gary. Um, you can see in the gray area the light industrial land that's designated and, and really kind of strangely in the midst of a lot of housing. And I mean, and you can, uh, history. It's not so strange, but in today's times, it could it could be perceived that way. Um, so, if we were to complete this process and find um, that there was a, a deficiency of housing that could uh, could could would the benefit of be uh, of doing the commercial lands inventory as well as part of this project allow us to look at the light industrial land for potential for um, if there's an excess of light, light industrial and not enough housing, the potential for uh, changing some of the zoning in the light industrial, would that be a logical step to take? No. I think that that question would be answered in economic analysis. The spillable portion of that would inform that. But you have to do um, an analysis of um, of how much industrial living is and it means, and so that would be part of that economic analysis. The employment land inventory would be part of that, but you want to do that economic analysis piece of it to understand if you have enough industrial land already. What is the market demand for that here? Um, do you have enough? And um, if not, you know. Well, if you have too much, uh, then you can definitely look at your options there. An interesting piece of this is that you'll you'll notice that um, the the ballparks are uh, within uh, light industrial. Um, so the the plan for that, even though you know it's it's parks use, 
and and I would be real tempted to take this that piece of it out of the employment lands because it's hard to use. Um, but we can we can definitely take a closer look. There's also uh, acreage. There's also acreage across the across Rogue River Way there that. Um, Oh yeah, here. yeah. Yes. There's yes. there's considerable land in that area as well, and um, I say uh, I I think it's important to put it on everybody's radar that doesn't have history uh, because TA four um, TA four is uh, if my memory serves me right is eighty percent light industrial or and, and it's employment land. It's employment. Land. Yeah. Right. So um, so if we do an analysis. Um, that shows that we have an excess of light industrial, which when we last did, we, we I think we we ended up with about an acre and a half after Williams Way was built um, of ex of excess. Um, bringing in TA four will exacerbate that, um, and uh, so I would hope that as a city we would look at the light industrial we have within the city, uh, more walkable, probably equally walkable services uh, before we before we exacerbate it with TA4. Um, I just think it's something that we should talk about as, as part of this long range process. And I just want, for those who yeah. haven't been part of the history of this, to put that on your radar. I, I would wonder um, if the park area was included in that industrial lands analysis, and if there was a study done um, with this portion that is outside, um, or on the other side of the railroad. So I would, we should kind of take a deep dive and see if that, if the industrial lands were the complete, you know, industrial area. Yeah, I would. Um, because that would change things a lot. If we're, if we're looking at this land and saying, you know, we really aren't going to do anything aside from parts and we'd want to remove that out. If we were looking at this land and saying, you know, there's not much that can be done because we've got the future of the railroad. Right, right. Um, we would probably want to remove that from a real in-depth, you know, analysis of industrial lands, and then you would just be looking at this area here. Yep. And there's the other question of if you do bring in anything in your URAs, um, you know, how do we leverage the the you know ability to build you know, multi-use and, and residential and commercial lands. So I don't think, you know, we can say that it would just be brought in as commercial and it would um, compound, you know, a, an existing problem if there's a, the opportunity to build residential in, you know, TA5 or TA4, those are your own. Which I think just in a different way mm -hmm. um, makes it as important to, to look at that before we yeah before we move forward yeah yeah we should we should take a look at that and and talk about you know what the plan is um, I'm not so interested in the park I mean if, if the park compounded the numbers I you know of course it, yeah it will play but there's so much available land across the way there not not across the railroad tracks but across Rogue right. River Way um, that. Um, it makes it makes sense to evaluate that as potential for housing, especially since it's a, mm -hmm. because of its proximity to bus lines and walkable to a park. I mean, there's a million, there's a lot of really good reasons to look at that. Yeah. So I think it looks like um, what we're talking about is this here, uh, town police, this building. There's um, there's it looks like available lands here. And then I don't I don't think there's anything here in this land here. It's the it's the piece, the last piece that you looked at that I think offers this, the community the here. biggest opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's accessible. Mm -hmm. um, it's a large piece. Mm -hmm. I think there's an additional, I think it's all together something like four acres. And um, like I said, its connectivity to services are pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely something that, that we can look at um, for employment plans and um, an EA. Great. I also think that if that were 
multifamily housing, which seems mm -hmm. appropriate, it will help us sell the fabric mm -hmm. glass. That property is yeah. all one work, it's all one lot. Yeah. So it makes sense. Uh, how, just one uh, thing, the housing capacity analysis, so we'll tell right. you, you know. What what type? Yeah, and, yeah. and that'll kind of bring everything together. And, uh, you know, I again, I don't think we're going to have any surprises. We need that, you know, we need them to be in high density. Yeah, housing. I saw the graph. Yeah, <laughs> so. Um, and that's uh, high density next to it, too, so. Yeah, yeah, so an appropriate place for it. But that that will say, you know, that will help us to the, We've got this much land available. We are considering, you know, rezoning this and um, using it for residential, and it's going to open up that capacity. Does that now cover our, you know, twenty-year horizon? Sorry, Gary. Yeah, you know, the uh, available lands inventory. Um, there's a high number, as you mentioned, for available acreage, primarily in the railroad district. Have you interacted with the other consultant who's doing the railroad district study? Yeah, I have provided them with this website. I've provided them um, with the draft of uh, what what is available. So I I have not talked to them about it. I'm certainly available for them to to call. They do have my contact information. Um, I've provided them with a number of of other GIS uh, speakers layers for. I'm just wondering if the two studies intersect at some point, uh, which I think would have one of the outcomes might have a significant effect. Yeah, absolutely. I hope that that this is useful for them um, when they are uh, doing the feasibility study. And uh, so I, I did provide it to them, but I, I haven't interacted with them beyond. I'm sorry, which other study are you talking about? I missed what you said. Oh, the railroad district stuff. Oh, the railroad. Okay, thanks. And Gary, I don't know where we're at. I think the railroad district study is going to tell us more. Just, just out of curiosity, the, the piece that is on the other side of the um, the railroad tracks, that's light industrial. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 do, I do know that there are constraints with the railroad crossing on wrap, but they're not the same as they are elsewhere. Yes. And, um, and, and I even think we did we develop a a conceptual plan for the upgrades to that as part of our emergency recovery. It seems to me like we did. I don't know. And um, so again, for those who don't have the history of this, I think it's worth putting on the back burner a discussion at some point in time, whether that's more appropriate as light industrial or uh or if there's an excess of light industrial and not enough housing as a result of the studies, is that an appropriate place to look for uh, as a redesignation re of housing? Um, I, I think those are discussions actually that have been floating around our city for as long as I can remember and um, be interesting to look at it again. Yeah. Absolutely. Which I really appreciate the fact that you brought up looking at commercial analysis as well for that per because I think it has that purpose among the other purposes that you mentioned. Yeah, really. <laughs> I remember you we we had a we had yes and you were like what about the commercial? And I said ah I'm gonna have to be ready for that. So thank you. <laughs> it was over a glass of wine, right? <laughs> <laughs> Might have been. <laughs> Uh, again, I am um, available to uh, to talk to. You can um, always reach out to Nick. Um, I'll make sure to see to Nick on any communications that we have so that he stays in the loop about this project. Um, our contact information is at the bottom of the page, um, so you can, can find us easily. Again, navigate to the um, City of Talent Community development website. Are there any final questions before I lose my voice? Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Thank you. You're welcome. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I did have one question. I've, I've been it's been on sitting on my head for the whole meeting. Is so this is all interactive, and it's a living document. Living document. So is there a plan in place to keep it updated? Um, so what I will do is when I move into the final phase, I'll be taking feedback. Uh, I'll be making sure to provide that feedback and save it so that, you know, who commented what, um, that will all be part of uh, the final deliverables that I get to you. Um, I will be changing the Build the Lens interactive map to show the final um, results, but I will preserve the draft as well. So there will be a draft preserved in your GIS um, as well as the final. And so this will always live in Talent's GIS system. I built it inside of your system. This isn't mine. You have to log into the Talent uh, GIS system to access and change it. So it's preserved. It's yours in perpetuity. Um, it's nothing that you know. I'll, I'll take with me and disappear down the road back to Michigan or something. <laughs> You know, I realize they just assumed we'd be adopting this at some point. Is that the case? Will we? Yeah, okay, good. Because I, I don't want to have, uh, I'll have to give Mary a call if that's the case. You, yeah. um, you, you may wait to adopt the BLI as part of an HCA, um, because if you adopt the BLI, you might be looking at a comprehensive plan update as well. And you might want to kind of look at the the steps and see how to bundle things appropriately to make sure that it moves as quickly as, as possible. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that I'm surprised because I know that in practice, when we make changes to the zoning, we make a comprehensive plan amendment at the same time. So I'm a little bit wondering if maybe there was just some sort of uh, things got out of sync. Um, document wise uh, uh, with the, the with zoning and huh? yeah i know there was a lot of attention yeah, zoning and maybe sure. just some updates that perhaps were approved just didn't make it into the electronic document or something like that or the there's a very good reason for things that <laughs> <laughs> nine times out of ten there's a really good reason that it's the way that it is but isn't readily apparent so great thank you thank you thank you so we're going to be moving on for the planning commission for the title 1718 discussion. So we're going to be moving on to the title 1718 yes. discussion for planning commission. Okay. 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 Uh, we elected not to retain a, a consultant to assist us in the things, uh, but to provide uh, the expertise that we had in the office to um, uh, do a very similar enough uh, to buddy you. Okay. Uh, again, I think it's the only way that the kind of 17 people that they use, but the data in the uh, Community development of Lincoln's plan of work, which is listed as a conclusion date of January 2025. That's probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no funding has been allocated. Uh, the maintenance services has been affected for it. So there's some type of estimate. Um, uh, and there are a number of actors coming on there. The little lands of the Tory of the Tory District, other activities are going on and planning that will affect that as well. It will be incorporated as the version is updated. But I propose to kind of modify in house approach to review level 17 and 18. Uh, and that was to put together a four team 
I like the idea. I just want to talk a little bit about technically what what this committee would be. So it sounds to me like it's like a technical advisory committee. Is that what you have in mind? In a way. Yeah. And then, um, and what what would be the outcome of this advisory committee? Would they prepare a draft document to bring to the planning commission? Yeah. Planning commission would review it and adopt it. Or a review review it and recommend yep. it. <clears throat> and um uh and so it would be an advisory committee to the planning commission, it sounds like a technical advisory committee to the planning commission. So it's really about what we go for uh for consideration after the committee we engage the land use and verify that we're in fact keeping real Council Panamara? Oh. Yeah. So uh I, I too think this is a good idea. One concern I might have would be staff capacity, but obviously you thought of that and, and it's go. 
Um, I'm just remembering back when we had, uh, I think Elizabeth Decker uh, work on this for us, there were, there were two things that were um, positive about having, having a consultant. One was, I think it was with the grant um, from Bielski. Um, the other thing that I think that a consultant can bring is just the idea of um, having had experience in, in other cities um, in Oregon and kind of being really up to speed on the latest uh, from the state. So those were two things that um, were seen as positives at the time of going with a consultant. Um, so I just wanted to mention those. I, I think uh, what comes to mind is that uh, we might want to think about assembling this group as a technical advisory to RV Cog, to Shandell. Um, because if we if we create a technical advisory committee for planning, then it's subject to the appointment policy. And then the appointment policy opens up applications to community members at large. Um, and which is which is not a bad thing it's just that for technical advisory what you're what you're talking about is putting together uh a group of people with particular expertise in this area for a draft that eventually comes before the commission anyway so um, i like the idea we just i just we should probably talk about how to how to form this advisory committee in a way that is really a technical advisory to either staff or a technical advisory to um, yeah to our contractor at RV Cog, um, rather than just forming another committee subject to the charter, basically. Yeah. Which technical advisories are usually typically built that way? So, just so you know. Would this be something you put on the next agenda? Yeah, I put it on the next agenda. Um, we so, so, we'll put it a little more. Who wants to talk about it? Well, if it were, I mean, again, here again, I mean, if it were a if it were an, a committee that was being um, developed or being, if it was an advisory to the planning commission, it would have to come to the uh, council first because it, it's according to the charter, that's our purview. Um, but if you're gonna assemble a technical advisory committee, I don't even know that you need to have, you don't even need to have a, an approval. I mean, it might be good just to report it to a meeting um, and get consent just for good housekeeping, but um, advisory committees to staff and consultants are not, don't go through the regular appointment process. Yeah, and the charter spells it out and the uh, appointment policy spells that out. So, um, yeah. All right. I'll push it on a little more. This is good. It's all right. Uh, and uh, here we go. Uh, I'll wait until Kendall comes back from her. I think it's a great idea. I just would make one last comment on this. For technical advisory, uh, I would say so that we're not just circumventing our normal policy. Um, that would be defining the technical advisory as an advisory to staff, but also of technical experts in this in this area. A couple planning commissioners, a couple counselors that have planning experience, I would hope, and then uh, and then the rest of the advisors are somehow associated with um, somehow associated with planning. Yeah, so so we're not just trying to circumvent the appointment policy. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think uh, that I found it very, uh, very helpful uh, in the last experience that I had with this to have a counselor who has had some kind of experience with planning commissioners who's uh, 
would have experienced the Midwest application to the state command and questions all through the drive before the council on the planning. Folks on the team that were not necessarily technical, but it brought a little of the community. So that, I think that's where I'm, I think that's what I'm saying is that if we're looking for community perspective, I think that does subject it to the, the policy. But I, we can have further discussion and maybe we should touch base with Dave on this a little bit. But um, if we're looking for community perspective, if that's what we want, then then there is a process laid out in the charter for that, and we should probably follow up. But if we're looking for a technical advisory committee to assemble a draft to bring before the bodies uh, for mm -hmm. approval, I think that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to me mm -hmm. because it sort of cuts, it mm -hmm. it, it really is the, the, the technical replacement of a technical consultant. Like to me, it's apples and apples to some degree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll both do it, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the one thing um the one thing I would ask